Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, web conference. This is the first of a series of web conferences that we'll be conducting uh, here in the first quarter of 2017. And along with that, Happy New Year's to everyone. Hope you had a safe and enjoyable New Year's. And here we are winding out the first week of January already. Um, again, on your screen is the uh, schedule for the winter web conferences. Uh, these are all geared towards our irrigation customers. Um, as you can see by that schedule, uh, we basically are running two uh, conferences. Today is the pumps overview. Uh, next Friday will be the House of Resistance, which is a new model, a very easy to learn and, and re, uh, recall a uh, uh, way of uh, sizing centrifugal pumps. So we're going to do a repeat of each of those over the next couple of months. And again, um, I, I assume that most of you have got registered through either a Facebook posting that we've done, uh, a flyer that we've mailed out. Uh, this is also available. Uh, to register on our website, and I do know that everyone on here today will be getting some type of an email blast early next week for uh, the, the, the next web conference. So with that, we're going to get started, and today, again, with Irrigation Pumps Overview, the objective is to just briefly uh, discuss various pumps that we manufacture here at Clinton Walling that are very conducive to being sold within the irrigation industry. And it's really designed so that you can uh, identify one pump from another. And if this comes across like I hope that it does, uh, you'll be able to do that uh, with a, vis a quick visual inspection. You don't need to look at a model number or a catalog number to determine what type of a pump uh, you're looking at. Hopefully with this conference today, you'll be able to do that in a more visual way. So with that, we'll get started. I hope these slides transition okay. And we'll get started with our irrigation pumps overview. When we look at the pumps that are conducively sold into irrigation, we can break these down into two types. And I, again, hope that your slides uh, are transitioning fine on, on your monitors. Um, but when we break these down into two types, uh, we'll break them down this way. The pumps on the left-hand side of your screen are what we would refer to as above-ground pumps. These are your jet centrifugal and self-priming pumps, and typically these will be installed in crawl spaces or on the ed uh, edge of a, a deck. Um, but the bottom line is these pumps are always visible. They're always installed above ground. And then the second category, of course, are the ones that are on the right-hand side of the screen, which we refer to as submersibles. So to begin our conversation on these pumps today, we're going to go back to the above-ground pumps, and we're going to break those down into two categories. The pumps that you see on the top are referred to as jet pumps, and those that are on the bottom are referred to as centrifugals. Now, that's an industry term that's used, and in my opinion, Quite frankly, every pump ever made um, uh, typically is going to be some type of a centrifugal pump, which we will discuss here in a few minutes. But with that, we're going to focus on the top column of these above-ground pumps, uh, the jet pumps. So when we look at jet pumps, um, we're going to break those down into two types as well. So with jet pumps, you've got a choice of either a shallow well or deep well. A lot of times when I'm conducting seminars, you know, regional contractor meetings or distributor meetings throughout the country, uh, I, I oftentimes get asked, you know, why do they call jet pumps jet pumps? And, and so I, I guess to better understand that, um, all jet pumps come with, uh, with either a jet or an ejector. Uh, either term can be used. Those, are, those images are on the bottom of your, your screen right now. The big difference is that a uh, shallow well, which is on the left-hand side, the jet that you see down below actually bolts right up to the face of the pump, as you can see in the illustration, where a deep well jet is going to be installed further down the line. So it's not a, a, a device that gets uh, put right on the front of a jet pump like the shallow well ejectors do. But to give you some idea as to how these pumps function uh, and, and, and to understand maybe better as on how they, they go about pulling and pushing water, 
I'm pretty sure that most of us have at one occasion or another done something like the image that you see on your screen now. You're out, you're watering grass, you're watering the garden, you're watering bushes, you're washing a car. So all of us have had the opportunity to have a garden hose in the end of our hand. And uh, most of us know that if we take our thumb and put it over the end of a garden hose, we actually create velocity. Uh, when I'm conducting a seminar in a classroom or a meeting room of some type, you know, I'll stand in the front of the group and I'll, I'll tell them I, if there was a hose bib right up here connected to this wall and I hooked up a, a small piece of garden hose to it and I opened that hose bib up full bore, there's a probably a better than average chance that those, of, those that are sitting in the first maybe one or two rows, I could probably get wet just by standing in the front of the room. But those that are all the way in the back, pretty safe. Unless you've got a lot of pressure, you know, typically you're not going to get that kind of velocity out the end of a garden hose. However, when you put your thumb over the end of it, that all changes. And you can create velocity. And when I put my thumb over the end of this garden hose now, nobody in that meeting room would be safe. I could soak everybody that's in there because of the velocity that I've created. So these kind of devices have been made to go on the garden hose to do just that, to increase that velocity. And one of the things that I want to discuss with you today is, is what happens when you run water through a nozzle. And basically that's what's inside these devices is, is a nozzle type. So I've got a drawing here. I'm going to try to explain this drawing to you in the best way that I know how. But uh, picture a piece of pipe with a nozzle installed in the middle of it, as you see on your screen. And then off to the side, kind of a Y-type connection. Um, this would be connected to this pipe so that when we run water through it, when we force water through this pipe and it goes into that nozzle, what happens on the outlet side of that nozzle is there's a tremendous amount of velocity created. Again, very similar to putting your thumb or finger over the end of a garden hose. But what that velocity does is it creates a suction behind it so that as the water is moving past, it would actually, if you put your finger over the, 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 uh, the, the, the upper pipe of this assembly here, if you were to put your finger over that, you would feel that it would want to suck your finger down into that pipe because of all that velocity moving through that pipe down at the, at the lower section there. We all can see this happen sometimes if you're running down a highway in a car, someone happens to be smoking a cigarette. If you don't roll the windows down, within a few seconds, the whole compartment of that car would be filled with smoke. However, if you just roll the window, roll the window down just a little bit. You don't have to roll it down all the way. Just crack the window open a little bit. We all know what will happen with the smoke that's in that car. As you're rolling down the highway, that smoke will have a tendency to get sucked right out of the compartment of that car through that small opening in the window. Why is that? Because of all the velocity of air moving past that opening in the window, it also creates that suction effect that can pull the smoke out of the car. Many times you'll see in, in racing, uh, like uh, NASCAR uh, drivers, uh, they'll, they'll move right up behind one another, and they call that drafting because when a car is, 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 is moving ahead, it creates almost a suction type effect behind it if it's moving at a high rate of speed. And if you can position your car in that area, that draft, then you don't have to use as much fuel, you don't have to be on the gas as much because you're actually being somewhat pulled uh, by the vehicle in front of you. And so that's what these nozzles do is they, they create the velocity which in turn creates suction. Um, you can go into uh, you know, stores and, and buy uh, fertilizer that comes in a little jug perhaps like you see on your screen today. And I, I've asked contractors while uh, conducting these seminars, what is it about this that, that allows that fertilizer to come out of that jug and be, and be added to the water? Well, it's the same process and the same principle we just discussed. As water goes through that uh, top portion of that jug of fertilizer, it goes through a nozzle of sorts, 
and then creates that velocity, which in turn creates the suction to pull the fertilizer out of the jug, mix it with the water, and then it's being applied to your landscape, bushes and, and grass, and et cetera, et cetera. So with that, if we go back to these injectors, whether they're deep well or shallow well injectors, uh, what we'll find is that in each side, each, inside each one of these is a nozzle that's placed in there. And I want to just show you what that water would look like uh, as it as it passes through that that nozzle area there. So coming from the pump, uh, a portion of the water coming from the pump on a jet pump is going to be directed into the jet assembly, which is where the nozzles uh, retained. And as you can see, coming from the pump, it goes into that jet assembly. It makes a 180 degree turn, and it comes right back out through the nozzle uh, on into the pump and on into the irrigation system. But a portion of that water that that pump is producing is going to be used to drive that jet or, the, or to uh, run that water through that nozzle. And of course what that does, as we've already discussed, is it would create suction and that suction is what allows that pump to pull water from the water source. This jet that you have on your screen now is a shallow well. It is the type that bolts right up to the front of the pump. This jet is a deep well jet, and it, um, again, is located further downstream, perhaps closer to the water source, uh, but it operates the same way as the shallow well. So when we've got water coming in from the pump, uh, it'll make a sharp turn, go back up through that nozzle, create that velocity, create that suction, and that's how uh, a jet pump is able to pull water uh, from a water source. This next image is actually a live uh, cutaway uh, of, of a, an injector assembly. So you can see the nozzle located uh, within uh, that, that jet assembly there. You can see the nozzle. So again, I know this is a bit redundant, but the water comes in, makes that sharp turn, goes back through that nozzle, and then through the venturi, creates that suction. And that suction is necessary for the pump to pull water. and uh, from wherever the water source is at. So in a very quick way, that's how these ejectors or these jets function. As we mentioned, there are two types of jet pumps. The first was a shallow well jet pump. A shallow well jet pump can also be referred to as a single pipe pump. In other words, if you look at the illustration on your screen, there is just one pipe leaving that pump going to the water source. Now, the image on your screen shows that that water source may be coming from a well, but it could be a cistern or it could be a lake. Um, wherever that water source is at, uh, you can always tell a shallow well jet pump from a deep well jet pump because of the one pipe, the single pipe that runs to the water source. Now, the reason they're referred to as shallow well is because these jet pumps have the ability to pull water from a distance or to lift water from a distance of 25 feet or less. And we're going to hit on that a little bit more here in the next few slides. But if your water source is further away than 25 feet, and what we're talking about there is we're talking about vertical distance. If, it's, if the water source is more than 25 feet away from the inlet of that pump vertically, then you may have to resort and go with the deeper well uh, jet pump. But when we look at the, when we look at the, uh, the shallow well jet pump, I want to touch on this uh, 25 feet or less. And this is what we're talking about when it comes to lift. Um, the distance from the water level, and this is key, the distance from the water level uh, to an imaginary line that would represent the inlet of that pump, that's what we're talking about when we talk about lift. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about 25 feet or less. So I had a contractor at a meeting the other day, you know, share with me that his foot valve is down there considerably further than that. He said, shouldn't I consider that part of the lift? And the answer is no. 
lift is measured from the water level, not where the foot valve is located. And in this illustration, you can see the foot valve is going to be somewhere down below that water level. But for sizing purposes and for lift purposes, we're simply talking about the water level, not where the check valve is located. And one way to, to, to maybe uh, give a better example of this is this glass that now should be on your screen, uh, filled with water. And you can see a line there that indicates the water level in that glass. And I shared this with a contractor the other day. I said, sir, if we put a straw in that glass of water, let me ask you a question. Where will the water level be inside that straw? And he said, well, you know, it's going to be about the same level as, as, as it is in the glass. And so, yes, that is exactly right. So when you put your mouth over the end of a straw and you start to draw the liquid or the water out of it, you're really only having to lift that water or that liquid from the level that it's at up to the top. And again, we refer to that as lift. If, by chance, the water is further away than 25 feet, that's when we will go with a deep well jet pump. These jets or these ejectors that you see have the ability, after the water's been redirected through that nozzle of Venturi, it has the ability to create the velocity that in turn creates the suction, but that suction doesn't go on forever. I mean, you can get, if you get down below 25 feet with a, and your jet's more than, uh, you know, 25 feet away from the water, level, you'll have a difficult time pulling that out because it doesn't have suction that goes on forever. So what we do when water is further away than 25 feet is we, we, we go with a deep well. Um, the differences between the deep well and the shallow well jet, as you can see, the deep well is referred to as a two-pipe system. So in other words, the lower pipe that you see on this illustration is the pipe that actually runs water back down into that ejector, makes the turn, comes up through the nozzle, and venturi creates the suction down there instead of up at the pump. And so that's why with a deep well jet, we're going to locate that jet closer to the water source. And so with a deep well jet, uh, as you can see on the screen, we can lift water uh, as high as 90 feet. Uh, from a depth of, of 90 feet. So when we talk about irrigation pumps and we're talking about jet pumps, which is one of the two types of above ground pumps, they can be defined as shallow well or deep well. They can be defined as single pipe or two pipe. So again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this web conference, uh, my goal is to enable you to visually be able to tell the difference from one pump uh, from one pump to another. And so if there's, you know, two pipes running to the water source, that automatically tells me that that's going to be a deep well jet pump, uh, where with a shallow well jet pump, there's just the one pipe that runs to the water source. So when we go back to these above ground pumps then, the next uh, category we're going to look at is, is the centrifugal pumps, as you see on the bottom. So now when we use centrifugal pumps, and I guess before we go into these pumps and, and peel back a couple layers on these pumps, I'd like to talk about just the term centrifugal and primarily what we call centrifugal force. If you'd like a good laugh, I'll tell you how you can get it. Tonight when you get home, if you have some spare time, you can go on YouTube. And you need to only type in two words, and they don't have to be in any particular order, but basically you're going to type in merry-go-round, and then your second word will be motorcycle. Or you can type in motorcycle with the second word being merry-go-round. And what you're going to see is that there were a, uh, one of the YouTube clips that shows a couple of these young guys come up and they, they hop on this merry-go-round, and a couple guys are sitting adjacent from each other where the third guy takes his motorcycle, lays it on the ground, and engages his rear wheel with the edge, the bottom edge of that merry-go-round. Kind of looks like that. And so what happens in the initial part of this is that, you know, the, 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 the guy that's got the motorcycle kind of throttles it up just a little bit, and the friction between his rear wheel and the edge of that merry-go-round starts to spin that merry-go-round a, a little bit, 
and have, everybody's cool and they're having a great time and I think they feel like they've invented sliced bread here. But uh, as the video goes, these guys get a little more courage and they ask the guy to throttle it up a little more and then a little more and I'm going to leave it there. Um, if you want to see how that all ends, uh, go to YouTube and type those words in and you'll see for yourself. But these two guys got to firsthand experience the force that's behind centrifugal force. Oftentimes, when we're watching weather at night, you can see aerial shots of hurricanes. And, and you can see with centrifugal force, as you spin around, everything gets thrown out. And you can see that with a, with a hurricane. As, as it spins, it, you know, the cloud formations start to expand out away from the center of that hurricane. If you can see the, the image clear enough, in the center is a small black dot, or it looks like a small round dot. And I've asked contractors, I said, do you, anybody have an idea what they call that? And of course the response always has been, yeah, they call that the eye of the hurricane. And that's exactly right. And so when we're talking about centrifugal pumps, centrifugal pumps will have an impeller, like you see on your screen now. And the, uh, the impeller also has an eye, as you can see in the middle of that impeller. So as that water is being pulled from the water source, and it enters the eye of that impeller, and that impeller is spinning because of the motor behind it that's turning, what will happen is the water will enter the eye of the impeller, and then again, as that impeller is spinning, you will see that water come out the veins uh, of the impeller itself. And so that's, again, centrifugal force is a way of spinning something, and as you spin it, it wants to throw everything to the outside. So in a pump, when this impeller is put inside of a pump, and now you're looking at it from a direct, straight-on view, the water comes into the center portion of that impeller that you see on your screen. So the water coming from the water source enters that eye, and as that motor's turning and that impeller's turning, it will spin that water out of there, and that water that comes out of there is what goes up and irrigates our various zones and et cetera. So centrifugal pumps are pretty easy pumps to understand. It's basically an impeller. Uh, one thing I will say about the impellers and, uh, is that they, they, they're not like a fan blade, folks. An impeller will not move air. So inside these pumps, uh, they're designed to move a liquid, and in our case, it's water. And so uh, I will touch back on that here in a few moments when we talk about proper priming of a pump. So that's just a little thumbnail sketch on centrifugal force, and I want to move back to these uh, centrifugal pumps now. So as we had two types of pumps, above ground and submersibles, we broke it down with jet pumps, and we said, well, there's two of those, shallow well and deep well. When we look at centrifugal pumps, there's also two of those. One is referred to as a straight centrifugal, where the other one is referred to as a self-primer. I've often heard self-priming pumps also be referred to as lawn sprinkling pumps. So let's just talk about the first one, the, the straight centrifugal. The straight centrifugal, and, 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 and if any of you are familiar with the Flint Walling products, this would be representative of our CJ101 or our CJ103 or, our, excuse me, our C22000 models. Um, they're pretty simple pumps, meaning it's just a, an impeller that's hooked to a pump shaft that's connected to a motor, and as that motor turns, the impeller turns, turns and, and voila, it, this thing pumps water. So it's, it's a pretty simple pump, not a lot of moving parts other than the impeller itself. One of the points also brought up on this uh, slide is something I mentioned on the previous slide, is that these things will not remove or move air. And they must be primed with water before operation, and they must stay full of water at all times. So we'll come back to that in a, a few minutes when we, we, again, talk about priming pumps. But I want to spend a couple more minutes on impellers. With flint walling uh, model centrifugals, you, the contractor, you, the distributor, 
you have a choice between impellers. We, we offer our pumps, many of them are available with either a injection molded plastic impeller like you see on the left hand side or a no lead bronze impeller like you see on the right hand side. I will tell you that, that we manufacture both of these and I've had contractors ask me, they say, Painter, um, which, which of these impellers uh, do you think is best? Well, with the plastic injection molded impeller, the performance that you get out of that pump is very, very similar to the performance you would get out of that pump had you put a, bra had a, a brass impeller installed. Um, okay, well, if they perform comparably, what about, you know, what about uh, reliability, what about quality, what about longevity and all that good stuff? I guess the way I can answer that best is that our warranty return rates on these centrifugal pumps are typically less than about 2%, and you don't see a spike with the plastic ones versus the brass, so I would not turn my hand for the difference between the plastic or the brass impellers. I will tell you that with the plastic injection molded impeller, that's a very precise method of molding plastic. We do that. Uh, with an operation that we have down in southern Indiana that is, is company owned. So it's our own company that manufactures virtually all the plastic components for our products, but particularly these impellers. I will also tell you that if you run a batch of 4,000 of these, number 4,000 looks exactly like number one. It's very, very consistent. And so you've got consistency throughout the whole uh, batch of impellers that you run. And again, that's part of that precise molding process. The brass, on the other hand, uh, usually that's a cast brass that uh, will require some machining. Well, when you do that, um, you want to make sure that you balance the impellers. So all of the uh, flint wallings uh, impellers, all the bronze impellers are going to be 100% balanced even those that you may order as a replacement part. We take the time, we put these impellers on a, an axle like you see on your screen. And I've told contractors before, listen, if you bought a set of tires for your car or truck, you would be an absolute fool not to have those new set of tires balanced before you put them on the vehicle. And I think most of us probably are well aware that if a tire is out of balance, if it's out of balance, you get vibration, you get shaking, you get rattling and rolling around. And if you don't correct that situation, that, that continual vibration and, and, and shaking will eventually wear something else out, like perhaps a bearing of some type. So it is very important that impellers are balanced and run true. And with your car tire or your truck tire, if it's if it's out of balance, the, the operator will add weight. And you've all seen this before where they'll clip lead weights onto the rim of the tire to bring that tire into balance. Our operators in the factory that balance impellers, uh, number one, that's a very skilled position. And number two, when that, if that impeller is out of balance, they know exactly where they need to make corrections. Unlike a car tire or a truck tire, instead of adding weight, they will remove weight, and they do that by taking the impeller off that axle, walking it over, and it'll be marked where it needs to be, where the adjustments need to be made. They'll walk it over to a grinding wheel, and they will grind a little bit of the material off the back side of that impeller. So anytime you see a flint walling bronze impeller that has or appears to uh, have had a grind mark on the back side of it, know that was done deliberately, not maliciously and that that uh, impeller has been balanced because we know that if we can have a true balanced impeller, we can have a very, very smooth running and quiet pump. The other thing I'd like to say on impellers and is that a lot of these centrifugal pumps are referred to as a single stage pump or a multi-stage pump or a two or three stage pump. I want everybody to understand that when that terminology is used, a stage is referring to how many impellers are in that pump. So if you have a two-stage pump, that tells me that there will be two of these impellers that are inside of that pump. 
The other thing that these impellers do is they create a lot of pressure. The, the more impellers that you have, the more pressure you can create. And where that becomes very important is in areas that have elevation. And I will tell you here in Indiana, we don't have elevation. We are flat as a pancake. I think it's probably the primary reason why we can experience wind chills in the wintertime that are sub-zero consistently because there's nothing to stop that wind coming across our state. So if you're in other parts of the country like western North Carolina or Chattanooga, Tennessee or out west somewhere where you've got elevation and terrain to contend with, those are the areas where we will typically sell more of the multi-stage centrifugals because if a pump has to pump water up you know, 150 or 200 feet above where it's located, it, it needs the impellers to create the pressure to get the water up the hill. So in a, I guess just in, 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 in a, a condensed fashion, um, many multi-stage pumps are sold uh, where elevation has to be overcome. Um, but like I said, here in Indiana, most of the pumps sold are going to be single stage because we do not have that elevation to contend with. <clears throat> this next slide shows a, a cutaway of one of our CJ uh, straight centrifugal pumps. Um, this would be a three-stage pump. I actually had this, this model pump sitting on a display table at a trade show, an irrigation trade show one day, and I had a contractor come up and he looked at that thing and I I mean, I've never seen anybody get so excited in my life. He looked at me and he, he exclaims, those are brass impellers. It's like, yeah, yeah, what about it? He said, well, I didn't know any pump company made centrifugal pumps with brass impellers. And I went and told him what I've already told you. I said, well, you have a choice. Flint and Walling will manufacture that pump with your choice of either plastic impellers or brass impellers. And he shared with me that he had a situation where he had several centrifugal pumps that were pulling water out of a lake. He had several houses that he was irrigating with, and he told me, he says, you know, he said, every year I have to go out and change those plastic impellers, and in some cases I have to do it twice. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, I get out there and I take the pump apart and the impellers are just in shreds. And I said, well, what's shredding these pumps? And he held his hand up and he grabbed his little finger and he pointed to the fingernail on his little finger. He said, all I can tell you is there are shells, little tiny shells that are getting inside that pump housing and they're just creating havoc on those nylon or plastic impellers that I've got. I reckon those brass impellers will hold up better, won't they, sir? And I kind of looked at him strangely and I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. We've done a lot of destructive tests with our pumps here at Flint and Walling. We, we deadhead these things. We we run them dry, we rapid cycle them, we do all kinds of things to find out how does our pump react in those environments compared to our peer group or our competitors. So we do a lot of destructive testing here, not only with our products, but with our competitors' products as well. And I shared with this guy that at no time, to my knowledge, had we ever tested one of these bronze impellers on shells. But I said to him, given your track record, sir, if if I were you, I think I'd roll the dice. Well, I saw the guy a year later, same show, came up to me, said, you remember, uh, yes, I remember you uh, from a year ago. And he said, uh, well, I went out and changed all those pumps. I put your pumps in around that lake with the brass and colors. And I said, and? He said, I have not had to go out and change one set yet. So I suppose there's an argument in certain applications for a brass impeller over a plastic impeller. So that's a centrifugal pump, the way it's designed. A lot of people don't know this, and, and uh, I just think I'll take a moment to share with you that all these above-ground pumps, uh, Flint Walling actually manufactures the motors for every one of those pumps right here in Kendallville, Indiana. And I think that we are the only pump company in North America that continues to manufacture their own jet and centrifugal pump motors, and we've been doing that since the 50s. So motors are something that we're pretty filed into up here in Indiana. The second type of centrifugal pump is referred to as a self-priming pump or a self-primer. That is a little bit misleading, that term, again, because all pumps, all 
pumps, all above ground pumps, need to be primed before they can be put into operation. And so you can see in the second bullet on your screen, although they are quote unquote self priming, all pumps need to be primed initially in order to pump water. Now there is a big difference between a self priming pump and the straight centrifugal pump like you see here. Um, I'm not real certain why they refer to straight centrifugals like they do, but there's a lot of terminology within the pump industry that I'm not quite understanding why we selected those type of words. But if you look at a straight centrifugal pump, the water enters the inlet in the front and goes directly or straight into the eye of that impeller. Where the self-priming pump and the way to identify a self-priming pump or a lawn sprinkling pump from a straight centrifugal is that that inlet will always be higher, much higher than dead center. So the notion that a self-priming pump, uh, the reason they, they, they come up with the term self-priming touches on something we've already said, which is a, a impeller can, cannot move air. So if you have a straight centrifugal installed and you lose system pressure, there's a leak somewhere and the system pressure drain, drains the system down, that water inside that centrifugal pump can drain all the way down to that uh, dashed line that I've put on that screen for you. So it can drain all the way to the bottom portion of that inlet uh, uh, portion of that centrifugal pump. And when you do that, now you've exposed a great deal of that impeller to air. And so therefore, that pump's going to need to be reprimed before it can be put back in operation. On the other hand, with a self-priming pump, if that same thing should occur, you can see because that inlet is so much higher that if that water were to drain down and that system drain down, it cannot go below the bottom portion of the inlet on that self primer. And again, with the dashed or the dotted line going across there representing the water level in the case of a complete system drain down, that impeller that's behind the uh, pump housing there would still be fully submerged in water and there's a better than average chance that even though you might have lost, lost system pressure, if you power that self primer back up, because that impeller is in water, it will create the suction and it will create, uh, the pump will go right back on stream for you. Therefore, they're referred to as self primers because they tend to keep their prime in certain adverse conditions versus the centrifugals. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about priming a pump. Um, all pumps, as we already discussed, need to be primed initially. And I want to spend a minute or two on, on this practice because I think sometimes this is hastily, um, uh, uh, this practice is hastily done and the pump's not primed properly and therefore it doesn't pump properly. But I'll give you a little analogy. When I was a young kid, I had an old car that had a leak in the radiator and every day I had to go out and pour water in that radiator and I'd fill the radiator up, put the cap on the top and leave and, and you know, walk the jug back into the house. Well, my older brother happened to notice me out there one day and he caught me as I was walking back to the house. He said, I don't think you did that right. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, I don't think you filled that radiator up. I said, no, I did. I filled it up till the water come out the neck and I put the lid on. He said, come with me. So we walked back out to the car. He said, take the cap off. So I took the cap off, and sure enough, I looked in, and I didn't see any water in there. And so he said, add more water to it. So I added some more water to it. I got ready to put the cap back on. He said, well, hang on. Don't, don't become impatient. Just wait for a minute or two. Why is that? He said, you need to allow that air to dissipate up out of that radiator. And I don't know if you can see this very well, but the image on your right side kind of shows a bubble of air coming back out of there. And he told me, he said, now, so you just keep adding water until all the air is gone. Once the air is gone, then that water level and that radiator should remain consistent for at least a period of time. Then it's when you can put the lid back on or the cap back on. And he said, if you do it this way, you might not have to fill that radiator up every day. Rather, you might only have to do it maybe once a week. But 
if you do it right, you don't have to do it a, a second time. And so the same holds true when, when priming a pump. Most, or I should say, some pumps will have a priming port. In other words, there's a plug that you can remove on the top side of the pump housing, and you can add water through there. Or a lot of contractors on the discharge side of the pump will incorporate some type of a T with a plug on the one end of the T so that they can remove the plug and add water there. But the real key when it comes to priming these pumps is to make sure that not just the pump housing is filled completely with water, but that suction line where that, that comes into the front of that pump, wherever that goes, you really want to have that full of water too. So the biggest thing I would tell you about priming a, a, a pump or a centrifugal pump or a jet pump is to have some patience and allow the air proper time to dissipate out. As the bullet point points out, all jet and centrifugal pumps need to be initially primed with water in order to remove the air from the pump and the pipe. I think another bullet here is that uh, air pockets, bubbles, must be eliminated during this process. These are important. And here's probably the one comment that makes it most important. Failure to prime a pump or keep the pump primed is the number one cause for initial pump failure. And again, so many times I think it, it's a, it, we get a little hasty and uh, we have not allowed all the air to purge itself out of that suction line and that pump housing before we try to put the pump into operation. So make sure that you practice patience when priming the jet or centrifugal pump. So what we've talked about up to this point then are the above ground pumps. And again, on your screen, you've got these, these uh, pumps at the top left side. Those are jet pumps broken down into one of two categories, either shallow well or deep well. Below that, you have centrifugal pumps broken down into two categories, either straight centrifugal or a self primer. With the few minutes that we have remaining, We'll talk about submersible pumps. By their name, um, that should be fairly easy to figure out. Submersible pumps will always be submerged in a body of water. Again, that can be a well or that might be a cistern. I know that some submersible pumps are put in lakes and, and, and ponds. Um, they're always going to be submerged in water, and that's pretty important because on the above ground pumps, the motor is cool is an air cooled uh, motor. So there's a fan inside the motor that that cools that motor. With submersible pumps, those motors that you see are cooled by water. So when we look at a submersible pump, you know we can basically break it down into four areas. Uh, at the very top is a discharge. Uh, that's what screws into the top of the pump, followed by the stack, or some people call it a cartridge, but it's inside of there that you will see all the impellers. And then there's a suction screen located between the pump end on the top and the motor that's on the bottom. So we're going to look at the discharge here real quick. And when we look at the discharge, there's a couple of components inside there. Uh, one is a check valve that you see at the top. Uh, this is a poppet style check valve. Uh, Flint Walling has spent a tremendous amount of time refining uh, the check valve that goes in, inside of this pump to where it's an anti, it doesn't spin. And you've got to understand that on a submersible pump, the water coming out that discharge probably is spinning at the rate the motor's turning. So it's a very turbulent environment that this check valve has to uh, function in. And so we've made our check valve so that they, they cannot spin. The way we do that is the, the uh, stem that's on the top side of that poppet that runs up through the guide. That is a rectangular stem and the opening in the guide that's above it is also rectangular. So you cannot put a rectangular object into a rectangular opening and expect to turn it. So that's what gives it its anti-spin characteristic. The other thing that you'll see just below that pocket check valve is a, what's called a discharge bearing. And Flint and Walling, uh, unlike most all of our competitors, continues to use a, a no lead bronze 
a discharge bearing. And the reason for that is it can withstand heat. So if pumps get into deadhead situations, if pumps get into run dry situations, if pumps are put on abrasive type of water, this particular bearing um, will do a, a very good job of keeping that pump uh, up and running and operating. Uh, the other thing about this discharge bearing is it is closed on the top side. It's closed. So um, the image that's on the right of your screen, you can see the pump shaft going into the bearing, but if you move on up above, you can see that that bearing's closed on top. A lot of companies will choose to use a sleeve bearing of some type where the pump shaft actually goes all the way through the sleeve bearing. You see it go in the bottom and come out the top. Uh, we chose not to use that design because, first of all, it's not watertight. Water can get between a, on a sleeve bearing. Water can get between the, the pump shaft and the bearing itself. It's not watertight. And if you happen to put this on a water supply or a water source that has any type of uh, sand or abrasives, then also sand and abrasives may get between that pump shaft and that bearing and prematurely wear that bearing out. If you lose the top bearing on a submersible pump, you will lose the whole pump. The whole pump will just lock up on you. So with the closed bearing concept, the whole notion is if water can't go through that bearing, then neither can the sand or the abrasives that may be in a water supply. So at the top, again, we have the check valve, and then just below that is the discharge bearing. When we look at the stack, when we look at the submersible stack, uh, uh, you will find that th there are many, many stages, and we learned that a stage is an impeller, and there are many, many stages within here. I believe the pump end that's being displayed on your screen is a, one of our smaller 10-gallon-minute pumps, but yet if you were to count all those stages, that, that, that there's, there's many more than you would ever have in a centrifugal or a jet pump. So a submersible pump has got the ability to pump a tremendous amount of pressure, and I know in some parts of the country, these things are installed, you know, eight, nine hundred feet or further down in a well and yet still provide plenty of pressure up at the ground. Um, what separates each of the stages are thrust washers, impellers, um, submersible well pumps utilize multiple impellers that stack up on top of each other. And again, as we talked about earlier, each impeller increases the pressure of the water. So. Uh, whether it's a centrifugal pump or a submersible pump, we still refer to all those impellers inside of that pump as a stage. So most uh, submersible pumps will have far more uh, impellers and staging than a, an above-ground pump could ever hope to have. When a submersible pump is put into water, um, as you might see from the diagram, the water enters the suction screen. There is no priming a submersible pump, by the way. Uh, once you put it in, in, in a body of water, you can power it up and it will immediately begin to pump water. But that water is drawn in through the suction screen, which we already talked about, being located between the pump end and the motor. And so as that water gets drawn in, it will be pushed out right up the top discharge. And so one advantage that a submersible pump has over an above ground pump is this. An above ground pump has to really do two things. It has to lift the water before it can begin to pump the water, where you do not have that equation going on with a submersible pump. It simply has to push the water out. There is no lift. It's always submerged in water. As I mentioned, these submersible pumps are also, the motors are water-cooled. So again, as the water flows past that motor to get into that suction screen, that's what keeps the, the motor cool. On some applications, when you get into larger horsepower, you know, above two horsepower, uh, and these are put into like pond systems, contractors will shroud the pump. Because if this pump is sitting out there in the middle of a pond and it's a large horsepower motor, there's a risk that that motor could overheat. The, the smaller horsepowers, we're not concerned about in the least. And again, two horsepower or below, the technology and motor development has evolved so much over the last 20 years that the smaller horsepower motors 
are not a concern uh, for overheating. But when you start talking about three or five or seven and a half horsepower motors or larger, you want to be sure if you put that kind of a pumping system into a large open body of water that you shroud that pump. And I try to give you some indication of what that shroud would look like. It's, uh, it's basically uh, a sleeve that goes over that pump. It connects up at the discharge. But in order for the water to be pumped, it has to enter through the bottom of that sleeve. Well, by entering through the bottom of the sleeve, it, that's where we get that flow of water going past that motor to help dissipate and carry away the heat that, that motor can uh, create. And so that's what keeps a, a larger horsepower motor in, in, in within its cool operating uh, range is when you put a, a sleeve on it. Some people call these flow inducers. Again, there's a, a variety of names, but basically that's what it, it consists of is, is, is sleeving that pump. When it comes to submersible pumps, there are two types of those. There's a two-wire pump and there's a three-wire pump. You know, when submersible pumps first hit the market, they were almost all exclusively three-wire pumps. A three-wire submersible pump will come with or needs to have a externally mounted control box. Inside that control box is a start capacitor and a relay. And the notion that contractors had back in the day when, when these were sold is that if a, a capacitor or a relay ever went out, they could simply go out and pull this uh, cover off the control box and replace them without having to pull the pump. Then after that came two wire pumps. They were a little easier to install because you didn't have to wire a control box and those components that were in the control box are actually integral to the motor and a two wire pump. It varies by geographic area. You take the Pacific Northwest, you take areas like Texas, it's almost all predominant three wire model pumps that are sold. Here in Indiana, it's just the flip side of that. It's all seem to be mainly two wire pumps that are sold. And again, uh, it's really come down to contractor preference and contractor choice, but it, it is a little bit ironic that um, you know, in certain geographic parts of this country, um, you'll find that uh, they'll either be leaning more towards the three wire type pumps, because that's the way daddy and granddaddy did it, uh, or they want that feasibility of being able to change the capacitor or relay out so when it comes to submersibles, you have two choices there too, two-wire and three-wire. I see we're running right up on top of the hour. So again, today's web conference, we're trying to keep these within a one-hour time frame. And today's web conference, uh, hopefully, you know, if you were to look at this screen, uh, which is one of the first uh, slides that I, I put up on this conference today, uh, based on what we've talked about, uh, you know, you could probably and hopefully be able to name these pumps just by looking at them. Um, so if you look at the pump on the top left, that's a jet pump. That's a single pipe jet pump. That would be a shallow well jet pump. Where the pump on the right, you can see the two openings uh, going into the pump. Again, those, go, those two pipes are connected to the ejector or the jet that's located further downstream. That would be referred to as a deep well jet pump. And then you've got your two centrifugal pumps at the bottom, as we've discussed. I'm sure if I were to ask everyone which one's a self-primer, uh, no problem. You know that's a self-primer. Why? Because the inlet is so much higher than the straight centrifugal pump. And then the pump, pumps that are on the, the right-hand side, uh, again, submersible pumps are available in a variety of horsepower. They're available in a variety of flow rates. Uh, but those were all submersible pumps. So with that, it looks like we've come up on the 3 o'clock hour, and I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today. I feel like we were moving at about 500 uh, words a minute, but uh, uh, as you can see, we will be conducting another web conference next Friday, same time, Eastern Standard, 2 to 3 p.m. Next Friday's conference will be entitled House of Resistance, uh, if you've ever had any confusion about sizing a centrifugal pump, that needs to be no more. So I would invite you to come back next Friday and learn about uh, the House of Resistance method of sizing pumps. 
with that, if you're traveling, I wish you safe travels. And again, thank you and look forward to seeing you all next week. With that, today's web conference is now concluded. Thank you.